I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm, so what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when it, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois, which is uh, definitely not a second realm. Uh, anyways, this podcast, everything found on the website, is covered by Bipcot's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the pledges thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. So today's episode will be the sixth installment of our Building the Second Realm series. Uh, so since we've discussed Vonu and Agorism quite frequently thus far, uh, we figured uh, it would be a good idea to compare and contrast those with the Second Realm. If you're coming back to LUA after more than a month-long hiatus, I don't know why the hell you, you would do that, but uh, then I would highly recommend uh, checking out the rest of the series before moving forward. If not the first three interviews, at least episodes four and five, uh, wherein we lay out the foundation with discussions on the culture and philosophy of the First and Second Realm. So joining me again is my co-host of the Vonu Podcast and our Liberty Under Attack creative consultant, Kyle Reardon. Uh, you can find his blog at thelastbastille.com. So Kyle, how are things going, man? I'm actually feeling unusually good today for the first time in in quite a while. Uh, you know, so, some some things have been have been moving that would kind of uh, imply a an improvement in my uh, work situation, so to speak. So. Uh, let's just say preferential work assignments are, are better than not. Otherwise, they wouldn't be preferential, right? Sure, sure. So uh, we talked about this on the Vonnie podcast, but uh, you did uh, you did get a new job, right? Uh, do you want to tell the listeners a little about that? Yes, and I guess that would be in addition to yeah. So I, I started uh, a new uh, new work in the uh, hospitality industry. So working at a hotel where I guess the closest descriptor. And keep in mind, I'm still in training, so I'm still trying to learn the business. But so far, it's like I'm equal parts accountant and security guard, if that helps. I don't know. I'm trying to make sense of it, too. Um, but but so far, that's been going well. And, um, in fact, I'll be I'll be going on duty uh, later tonight after we finish recording this. So uh, I get to, you know, do more of the business, so to speak. Um Earlier today, I did an interview with another division with one of my other employers, and um, yeah, it would be kind of like a transferal type thing, but not really because it would still involve still going to the same warehouse and such, but I would be working with a different team of people, uh, including having different bosses and all that, so uh, what the valuable thing about this different division and this different team of people is that now I can actually get formal customer service experience. It is actually customer facing. And uh, during the interview, uh, I brought up the whole performance metrics thing and how it was performance metrics are very important during the, the, the warehouse, at least as far as my time here. How important is it when we're you know ha you know, having interface interfacing with the customers? And I was told, not at all. I mean, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll scan a few QR codes, but that's about it. Otherwise, right. the main thing is making sure everything is smooth with the customers. I'm like, I actually said during the, I actually said during the interview multiple times, thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the performance metrics are basically if uh, the customer is satisfied. So, so yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that's a, a good change of pace considering, uh, you know, what you've, uh, you've been dealing with for 
Oh, the last six months or so has it been? Well, it's it's had its ups and downs, but you know, recently it's it's gone on the downswing because we're getting back to basics. So said on-site lower management, probably because they're worried about the incoming new uh, middle manager in charge, uh, to to put it colloquially, and they're all kind of scared because, of course, he's a military vet, and the last guy who got kicked out was himself a military vet, which which turned the place what is supposed to be a business into a battlefield. So we'll see how the new guy works out. Um, he isn't uh, he isn't on site yet, but he's expected any day now. So we'll see how that goes. Um, at this point, it's kind of like I'm just going to pretty much keep my head down on, unless, you know, I actually have to, like, stand up to him like I did the last one. And that one, there was, there was fireworks. Funny story for another time. But suffice it to say... For me, right now, things are looking quite up, despite some stuff that was not so good earlier this week where uh, they fell down on me like a ton of bricks. So, you know, if I can get some more customer service experience uh, with the one company uh, that I never had an opportunity to do before, and then with the new job, get customer service experience right from the get-go, that's a win-win. I don't, I don't want to deal with metrics anymore. Not that I ever really wanted to, it's just there wasn't really much. I didn't have options back then, and now I do. Right, right. Very good, very good. So uh, I guess just a, a couple, couple of quick notes here. Uh, for anyone who's listened to this podcast for for some time, or I guess back when we were doing live radio, I'm um, obviously a metalhead and obviously drum, and uh, you know some something uh, kind of negative happened this past week. I had to sell my drums. Oh, shit. No. Yeah. Well, I guess I didn't have to, but I I, I moved uh, an hour south for for this new uh, industrial electrician job, and uh, they were just collecting dust in the basement. So I figured, hell. Uh, why have them sitting there when I can, you know, buy some Monero with it and, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe uh, hopefully, you know, make some money off of it. And if I do end up, uh, uh, you know, here in the next uh, year or so, uh, actually, I guess, buying a house or something, then uh, I can always get another uh, you know, get another set if I want to. But uh, but yeah, that was, uh, uh, I guess it's, it's always nice buying more Monero because that's that's kind of my uh, my favorite uh, cryptocurrency. It's actually a cryptocurrency in uh Later on in, uh, in episodes of the Vani podcast, when we get to uh, the crypto anarchism portion, uh, there is some. Uh, we need to, do need to do some distinguishing in that episode, Kyle. Uh, Monero is an actual cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is not. Bitcoin is a digital currency, but we can talk about uh, that later on. But it is kind of funny. Now with uh, you know digital currencies becoming more popular, uh, the exchanges are, I guess, uh, doubling down on their uh, identity verification. And uh, since there are so many new, uh, I guess, customers. Uh, it's taking a long time. So I've I've seen all all week people complaining about I've been waiting for a week. Why can't I buy Why can't I buy currency yet? Well, <laughs> you know, good good for me. I use Verwalk. So uh, no matter what time it is, no matter uh, uh, you know what time of the evening, uh, without identity verification, I, I can always get my Bitcoin within uh, within minutes, and then I can get out to Cryptopia and uh, do whatever trading I want. So so yeah, the uh, whole identity verification process kind of backfiring a little bit. Uh, in addition to the violations of privacy. Uh, they can't get it when they want to, uh, whereas uh, I can with uh, the Virtual World Exchange. If you go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash support dash us, you can uh, click that, click through that link, and it's an affiliate link, and uh, you can uh, you know help us get some. Uh, you actually help me get some Second Life Lendens, uh, which then I can transfer to Bitcoin. So, uh, so yeah, there's uh, there's that. What can I say? Gray and even black markets are always much more efficient and customer friendly than white markets are. And uh, obviously, we'll, we'll 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 revisit that uh, here in in a little bit. Obviously, for for those who may not uh, understand those distinctions, but yeah, anytime you're working a mainstream job, whether it be corporate or not, but where you're basically subject to taxation, regulation, licensure, etc., you're basically dealing with white market. Uh, uh, type activity. And the one downside of white market activity is there's a lot of bureaucracy and, and so forth. So you mention about these uh, these privacy violations plus the inefficiencies of people getting their uh, you know getting their currencies or whatever. Um, why am I completely not surprised? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, and with the uh, the onslaught of regulation, I know that's uh, that has to do with this somehow. Exchanges are kind of scrambling to make sure they can continue staying open. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised here in the next few months or the uh, the next year or so if um, Veerwalk has to deal with that sort of stuff too, uh, which would be a major inconvenience for me since I'm not going to go give a blood sample to Coinbase or any of these other exchanges to to buy uh, digital currencies. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so it would make it more inconvenient. I, I'd have to go through a proxy merchant who would buy my uh, digital currencies for me, and uh, then I would buy from them for 10% markup or something like that. But uh, I don't know. For me, uh, that, that privacy is worth it. That privacy is is definitely worth it. And uh, I guess for now, 
Uh, things are going uh, quite well with uh, the virtual world exchange. Uh, and I think they're kind of uh, sliding under some of these regulations. First off, because they're in, I think, London. And uh, second off, uh, they it's a it's a digital gaming currency exchange. So like Second Life London's like the Sims currencies, like they're in-game virtual currencies. That's what that exchange is used for. So I think that's <laughs> how they get under some of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's working It's working fine for me with for, uh, for different purposes. So, And that was actually, Kyle, I don't know if I told you this, but remember a few years back when I tried to buy uh, Bitcoin to buy silver? Yes, and I think you wrote an article about it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was actually uh, Veerwalk. That was the one I used then. And so, <laughs> so I've been I've used it about uh, 50, 75 times now, and uh, you know it's working uh, working great. And uh, never thought I'd be back there, but it's the uh, seems to be the uh, the absolute best way uh, to buy uh, to buy Bitcoin and then uh, to get that into other uh, get that into Monero and other digital currencies. So, uh, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess there's that. Well, when you're when you're uh, waging. Uh... When you're using crypto anarchist methods, you know, and waging uh, your, you know, one man, uh, what you who's it against the state in that way, uh, sometimes the tools and or websites and or whatever else that you end up using or reusing or revisiting in some circumstances can make for strange bedfellows. So you tell me about uh, Veerwax. I'm completely like and thoroughly unsurprised. Um, and hence my chuckling a moment ago. And, and that kind of seems to be in some ways more normal than not where you do have to be kind of somewhat flexible in you know cyberspace or whatever the term is uh because it's pretty much you know what work what may work today may not necessarily work tomorrow but then again it may again work again next week so right, flexibility right. is key with that kind of thing yeah yeah that's true and i, and I will say like if, uh, if i make 150 dollar deposit i typically only get 120 dollars in cryptopia but again i'm paying for the convenience of getting my bitcoin now and not having to wait two weeks and i'm also paying for privacy um so that is a little unfortunate but uh for me that's uh you know that seems that seems worth it so i guess i'd add those those two addendums well yeah well, yeah and and just, just as a side note you know um i was a lava bit user that email service from a while back but then they uh, had they shut down because, you know, government was after them trying to, you know, basically subpoena them for user records. And they said, no, and the only other real move they could make, at least this is how they explained it to their users, such as myself, uh, was, uh, yeah, we're not, um, we're going to have to shut down business. Then it was like, what was it two months ago or, or a few months ago thereabouts? And because this is like this, all of this happened years and years ago. And then as of a couple months ago, they like partially reopened lava bed and, I've been able to like re-access my legacy email account there, which is good for other reasons. So yeah, when it comes to like crypto anarchy, whatever the hell, um, it's it's very it's very fluid and kind of has to be. Um, in some sense, I guess you could say it's a version on the theme of being mobile just a little bit. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, any other uh, preliminary notes before we uh, we get into uh, definitions. I would just simply say that as we go into this episode, ladies and gentlemen, please keep in mind that we're really not going to be talking really too much about the first realm or the servile society or like the mainstream culture really too much. That's not the purpose of tonight's episode. The purpose of tonight's episode is compare and contrast what some people would probably describe as creating the new society from within the shell of the old and or just creating something new completely different and separate altogether um that's kind of that's kind of the focus of, of tonight's episode is kind of comparing contrasting um different conceptions of libertarian communities might be one way of putting it and that that's the focus for tonight yes yes and well said so uh the second realm and this will probably be the fifth time we've defined this uh, so far in the series but i think it's worth uh, reiterating uh, especially when we're comparing and contrasting uh you know that the second realm with with other things so yeah, particularly if the so, yeah, particularly if the listeners are listening out of order. Oh, you're not following the rules. Ooh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff I've been dealing with at work. Don't 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 mind me. I'm I'm kind of the resident. Uh, oh, somebody called me a nasty name the other day, but they also meant a tongue in cheek. Where basically, uh, I kind of follow the rules that I want to and disregard the ones I don't want to follow. <laughs> And I, yeah, right, and I, right. and I said in response, I'll be more, I'm more than happy to follow the rules that make the, make the most sense in terms of, you know, facilitating what's supposed to be our free market uh, thing and, you know, making sure the customers get all their stuff on time and so forth. Um, but all the other stuff where it's basically just subservience to authority type of rules, uh, yeah, I kind of spit on that. So, oh, that's what I actually said word for word, by the way. I kind of spit on that. So, uh, yeah, make of it what you will. <laughs> right, right. So the second realm, quote, 
an updated version of temporary autonomous zones, TAZs, uh, essentially the ability to conduct trade, trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. TAZs were originally con conceived of as geographically mobile, uh, like Vanu shelters, yet now it may include cyberspace, uh, such as the deep web. Uh, now, Vanu, uh, where, you know, if you want more information on this one, there's a whole podcast devoted to it, the Vanu Podcast, uh, vanupodcast.com. Uh, so, Vanu is the condition or quality of, as well as the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion, or in other words, lifestyle changes individuals pursue to make themselves more invulnerable to coercion from both public coercers and private coercers, being, you know, uh, uh, the state and also uh, private criminals private violators of uh, of uh, person and property yeah muggers rapists uh thieves of various stripes um that that those are the private criminals the ones who don't have uh a blue costume a green costume badges uh, other bureaucratic pieces of paperwork or laws behind them uh it's it, you know and then of course the public criminals being the government so yeah just just be clear on that <laughs> yeah yeah uh so agorism is a strategy that advocates the goal of uh, bringing, uh, yeah, the strategy that advocates the goal of bringing about a society in which all relations between people are voluntary exchanges by means of counter economics. Uh, and then counter economics is uh, the sum of all non aggressive human action, which is forbidden by the state. Uh, for example, trading in the black and gray markets. Anyone tell the listeners a little bit, a little bit about uh, black and gray markets? Sure. So let's let's kind of. And for those who haven't heard this before, um, I'll try and keep this simple as possible. There is something called the agorist theory of the five markets. So there's the red market, the pink market, the gray market, the black market, and the white market. So maybe I'll tackle these slightly out of order. So red market is basically all those actions that are uh, illegal and immoral. These would basically be the things that the private criminals do, like uh, murder, rape, um, and, and, and some other things more along those lines, good old-fashioned theft and so forth. Uh, pink market would be all those actions which are similarly immoral, unethical, and so forth, but they are legal. These are things like taxation, military conscription. Uh, at one point, it used to actually be slavery. Now that's been kind of somewhat moved to red market. But at one point, it actually was legal to have slaves, by the way. Slavery was legal, according to government. That So it was pink market at one time. Um uh, oh, compulsory attendance at uh, public schools. That's that's pink market, too. And all, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there, there's there's like a thousand and one things that government basically forces you to do that. That's all, that's already immoral to begin with. Um, sure. White market are basically all of those activities that are regulated, taxed or licensed by the state. Um, so if people go to their you know, normal nine to five jobs or whatever, if they have to or otherwise the official rules of one kind or another say that they have to like corporate policy says they must file a W-2 and they must have 20,000 different licensures or actually they have to have three different licenses and then they have to follow 20,000 different regulations that have been laid out by an administrative agency. I, that fourth branch of government that nobody wants to talk about, um, then all that stuff would be good indicators of what you're probably dealing with is something that's white market. Uh, black market, arguably by contrast, although not necessarily, are basically all those things that are ethical, um, not immoral, that are ethical, but yet are illegal. And they are outlawed by the state. These would be things that are kind of range. Uh, it's, it's pretty much like three or four huge topics of things, but usually something having to do with dr drugs, guns, sex. And um, like, for example, if you're in Turkey, uh, if you have a Bible, at least at one point in their history, that was illegal, too, to have at one point. Uh, so there's nothing e there's nothing immoral about having a type of book. But according to the government, at least that particular one at one point it was black market, hence the old phrase about, you know, if a Bible smuggler and a prophet prostitute in Turkey meet each other in a back alley as they're being chased by different, you know, groups of blue coats or cops or whatever. Uh, are they going to snitch on each other? You know? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where that old phrase came from. So uh, let's see what else. Oh, and then, of course, uh, my personal favorite, the gray market. And the gray market is basically composed of those things which are ethical. So that would be kind of similar to the black market and uh, to some degree the, the white market, too. Um Basically, those things that are ethical but are not outlawed, yet also not licensed, not regulated, and not taxed. So these are things that the state doesn't have any laws on whatsoever, or for the most part, or there's loopholes or something to that effect. 
Um, in other words, if something is really truly gray market, even if a cop saw you doing it, he might be confused at first. But unless he's a really, you know, t the 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 stereotype of the corrupt cop. But of course, that's presuming there is such a thing as good cops, which is discussion for another time. <laughs> um, <laughs> All bludgies are bad. Sh well, sure, but um, but uh, unless it's the stereotype of the corrupt cop, generally speaking, if he's following the law, he can't bust you for anything because it's gray market. If it really is great market, and if he's enforcing the law, like many of them have told us, like we're, con you know, like as, as they're condescendingly you know, admonishing us, like as if we were irresponsible children, um, that that's kind of the bottom line. Is that if he's following the law, they can't enforce any laws against anybody uh, using uh, participating in any sort of gray market activities because, by definition, they're not illegal. There's no laws against it. There's no laws sanctioning it. There's just no laws. Period. It is. You know, without uh, government sanction or condoning or or whatever, it's just the lawyers, the government lawyers, just never got around to having either case law in the judiciary uh, ruling on some aspect of the human experience, or a legislature muscling their way into something that was none of their business in the first place. Uh, probably both of them exceeding the limits of uh, the hypothetical limited government thing with a constitution or whatever. But that's kind of the bottom line. So that's it. Now, wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't white or wouldn't gray market also be those uh, those professions that are legal? Um, but like, say say it's an electrician, he doesn't have his license in the state. Um, wouldn't that also be? Would that be gray market too? As long as there's basically virtually non-existent, no licensure, no regulation, no taxes, but it's presumably legal, then generally speaking, yes, it is gray market. The main, because remember, the main distinction between gray and black market is that black market is straight up illegal. It is outlawed. It is – if you get caught with that cannabis, presumably, let's say hypothetically, you – they slap those cuffs on and you're gone, kid. You're straight to the government dungeon. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Uh, gray market, they can't do that unless they're going to frame you or make up some other BS thing. But if they're enforcing their own laws and they're, they're, they're the good cops, they can't, they can't touch you. They can't arrest you. They can't do. They can't choose to squat. Now they may. They may. In, you know, hold you for investigative detention because they want to flex their muscles and you must be doing something wrong. But at the end of the day, they can't do squat unless they're going to straight up frame people. So that's just bottom line what it is. Right. Right. So uh, all right. Th those are the uh, the three definitions. Actually, four. Four definitions. So let's now uh, let's let's now compare and contrast the second realm with agorism. So I think the first point here is that. Technically, everything in the second realm would be counter-economic activity. Uh, hence, it would it would kind of be a requirement. Uh, although the uh, yeah, I mean, it would be it would be a requirement, right? Uh, uh, for for all activity in the second realm to be counter-economic. But uh, the the main difference is though the objective is not to smash the state. And additionally, um, with the goal of agorism, uh, agorism does the, the intention is to change the first realm with the eventual path of smashing the state. That is not the second realm. The second realm is counter-economic activity. Uh, without interference in the first realm. Yes, um, the at the risk of using the politically laden term, uh, it's it's mm, the second realm would arguably be closer to what most people would conceive of as a form of secession, even though more accurately, it's actually a, what it really is as a form of strategic withdrawal. Um, the strategic withdrawal of the second realmers is done to basically have a cohesive like mini society uh, in in some sense um the uh, the the agorists by contrast yeah there are the gray and black markets but the the intention is different the intention with the agorists is that let me put it this way the second realmers are i guess in some sense defensive but otherwise not offensive the agorists are offensive they are using they or at least their goal is to use black and gray markets to eventually abolish the state. So they are they are on the offensive, so to speak. So even the mindset, the intention of how to use gray and black markets is auto, is, is that that is pretty that that's pretty different. That's uh, maybe not necessarily polar opposites, but it's getting pretty close. Um, so yeah, and, and to, pro to, pro to provide another example there, um, if someone ex expatriates from from uh, the so so called United States, are they going to spend a bunch of time trying to uh, you know change the the government of the United States? No, the second realm is, is similar in that way where it's withdrawal, uh, kind of uh, you know just whatever whatever the first realm is doing, that's what they're doing. We're we're over here in our second realm. Yeah, it's again it's strategic withdrawal in much the same way that your run-of-the-mill voluntarist practice practices strategic withdrawal as a matter of course, for example, by not voting, right? So when a voluntarist, for example, 
uh, ha, you know, has a buddy who may or may not necessarily be a political crusader, but let's say is very knowledgeable about the current happenings on of the current versions of political crusading, your average voluntarist, assuming they're consistent, of course, uh, would pretty much go, well, that's vaguely intriguing, but like I don't vote, so therefore the relevancy of this to my life is what again? And that's kind of the attitude of the second realmers towards the first realm. It's kind of like, okay, well, the newest developments of the first realm are these things, and that may, may or may not be vaguely interesting, but what does that have anything to do with me developing the second realm and having proxy merchants and having good trade craft and getting uh, and developing better access control points and you know all, all that kind of second realm type stuff? And what's the relevance of the latest uh, thing, the latest catastrophe, quote unquote catastrophe in the news cycle of the first realm? And of course, there isn't. Uh, for the most part. Uh, very rarely, sometimes something may pop up that actually has relevancy, but it's really few and far between, at least in my experience. And I would right, assume... Right, and, and, the, and the, pro the proxy merchant uh, would have to concern himself with that. If he's, if he's going to be going in between the first realm and the second realm as a matter of, uh, as a matter of his business, his or her business, to be fair here, uh, then, yeah, he, 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 he or she would have to concern uh, themselves with uh, you know, what is happening in the first realm if there's going to be um, I guess more barriers to 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 doing whatever they do. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, the two uh, the the two definitely remain separate, and uh, uh, and and that's kind of the main difference between uh, uh, main difference here between the second realm and, and agorism. Uh, furthermore, uh, agorism, you know, clearly, uh, agorism can be done in either the first realm or the second realm. So um, that's kind of the the final main point I have here on uh, uh, here to, to to say. But um, but yeah, uh, the agorism in the second realm are more more alike than they aren't. But the as you said, the intentions and the goals are uh, are far different because it's all 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 activity in the second realm would be counter economic. So, um, I, I think that's probably more than fair to say, at least in large part. I mean, I'm right now I'm trying to conceive of could there be any conceivable white market activity in the okay, second okay. realm? And yeah, I'm, so I'm but I'm not. But honestly, I'm not. I'm just not seeing it. Maybe there's a vague possibility, maybe, but I I just don't see it. <laughs> but but, right. but black so, and so gray markets, yes. Yeah, it's, and, and and obviously, I guess some I guess some exceptions here would be kind of more of the cultural things. Uh, I guess counting out drugs and, and I guess the black and gray markets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just like like art and music, yeah. that wouldn't be counter economic uh, counter economic activity, but. Um, but those would kind of be the only exceptions, as far as I can I can conceive of. Sure, and and obviously the proxy merchants would need to keep themselves, you know, as clean as possible. So I guess they would be more inclined towards white market activity more so than not, just because of the due to the sheer necessity and expediency of what they're doing in order to facilitate import export. I think that kind of goes without saying. But you're asking more broadly, like is second realm activity. Is there any crossover between that and white market activity? And if white market is defined as anything regulated, taxed, and licensed hypothetically maybe in some limited circumstances but honestly i'm just not seeing it and i think the norm of the second realm would probably be uh gray and black markets for the most part okay yeah yeah so 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 for example they talk about in uh, second realm book on strategy that there was a club in germany a private club in germany that you know served as a second realm or something like that mm -hmm. um i guess there might be some aspects of the white market there if the sure. second realm is happening in a secret room uh, in a private club or something, because they would have their liquor licenses, they would have sure. um, the the property taxes, uh, things like that. So I think that might be kind of the only way. Is if, but that's a, that's more like being, a proxy. Yeah. That's closer to like being a proxy merchant in some sense. True. True. So and 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 so like if if it's done in that context where it's more like a cover or more like a front. I personally don't necessarily have an issue with that. I mean, I guess I mean the only other thing I can say is maybe it depends on a case by case basis. But uh, but using the example from the book about like the German nightclub, I don't necessarily see uh, see that as a bad thing. I mean, also something else too. The second realmers le have learned a lot, and it was actually mentioned in the book on strategy about learning a lot from organized crime and how they ha and how their various uh, whether it's the mafiosi, the Camorra the Akuza or others, how they conduct their, their various businesses of one kind or, or another. And yeah, there are times where organized crime will actually have licenses and paying taxes and being regulated to some extent, at least the front businesses do. So, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, does, does that mean the organized crime, the red market? So let me put it this way. If you have people who are active in the red market, but they have a white market front, does that necessarily mean anything? 
And what I'm suggesting is that for the second realm, if you have people who are mainly doing gray and black market trading or some combination, maybe more of one, the other, or maybe evenly balanced, it doesn't really necessarily matter. If you have people doing gray and black market trading, but they have a white market front, at least in some circumstances, much like how organized crime is a white market front for their red market activities, does, does that necessarily matter? Or is it just kind of like a feature of something to keep to, to keep both, you know, both the immoral organized crime as well as the ethically sound second realmers uh, give them a degree of protection against the state by having a white mark for both of them to have a white market front. See, I don't necessarily think most people in the in the servile society think like this, where you have to have fronts and covers, because that's usually like considered like like the uh, mainstream, uh, you know, espionage. Yeah, language. if you have if you have fronts, then uh, you have something to hide. And oh boy, if you have something to hide, then yeah, send the bludgies after them. Well, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. So say the guardians of the status quo. And that's very interesting because last time I checked, and even Ed Snowden mentioned this at length because of the nature of what he was dealing with, is that the is that government secrets government has like the most the most amount and most deadly and most serious of secrets that a lot of us still don't know about because it's still classified. So um, that's that that's 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 kind of the hypocrisy there is that you know the government wants everyone to be transparent, but they themselves want all the privacy and secrecy to themselves. When in fact, if, if there really was such a thing as a hypothetical balance of power with a limited constitutional government or whatever, then it would be the people who have the normal folks like you and I and, and whomever else, the most amount of privacy, secrecy and so forth as, as enumerated in the Fourth Amendment. And the government would be transparent because it is supposed to be, as the limited government people would say, it's supposed to be the servant, not the master of the people. Uh, but of course, reality shows something else, right? Once you get into the real politic, as the Russians would call it, the real politic of, well, politics, basically the government is the absolute master of everybody in, in large part to one degree or another because because then the people have been indoctrinated to allow them to you know ooh, we we now have to live with rulers and now we're just we're just debating about do we want a uh, this type of ruler or that type of ruler or i like the pol i like the public policy of ruler a versus ruler b or the party the party uh, a versus party uh, b's public policy and and so forth and it's just that's all first realm stuff you know, we're we're trying to have a second realm here where we can actually have um, something resembling peace and cooperation and trade. Sure, sure. So, so I guess, uh, do, do you, can you think of any other, uh, I guess, uh, uh, comparisons or contrast uh, that uh, should be mentioned regarding the second realm or agoras? I mean, it's it's mostly it's mostly similar, uh, except for those kind of two minor points that we that we mentioned. But yeah, you got anything else there? Um, in terms uh, in terms of agorism taking place within the first realm. The way I would kind of describe it is is this. If the agorists are in, I think Sam Conkin called it like a low-density agora society, then that's basically meaning that there's a couple agorists who otherwise live in a status-dominated area, and they're conducting trade anyway. And they're, they're, for the most part, existing in the first realm, and they're doing the right thing anyway. And by the way, those guys are my heroes uh, as a side point. Um because it is very risky stuff that they're doing. I mean, the, the risk can range, but agorism is just risky just by the nature of what it is. Um, the second realm can kind of lower the risk to some degree through the use of access control points and good trade craft and a couple other things. Uh, but a lot of times, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the agoras would sometimes throw cautions to the wind uh, in some cases. Um, not that that's necessarily a bad thing, because it is good to act on principle and, you know, do what is right, not not do what is necessarily easy, and so forth. But again, agorism is not necessarily for everybody, because it is not for the risk adverse. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, so the uh, the next part here is uh, comparing and contrasting the second realm and Vonnet, which I'm looking forward to this discussion, because I can't, honestly, I can't think of any real differences between the two? So uh, Rayo talked about and in, uh, in Vanu the search for personal freedom. Uh, he talked about he talked about Vanu many cultures, uh, and from from how I understand those uh, those would be second realms, uh, kind of the, their their own infrastructure. Um, 
being you know separate to do whatever. I mean, Rayo was a big pothead. He you know he yeah he he he, he didn't admit that personally, but uh, uh, but there's been uh, other corroborating documents and such. Um, so yeah, he had his uh, his uh, Vani mini culture. I guess he really didn't have a mini, a mini culture out there, but uh, well, I guess being as many as it could be with just two people, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, Vani many cultures and second realms, I view them as synonymous terms. Uh, I really do. I think that's probably a good starting point. I personally think there is some degree of, of distinguishing, which, uh, which will, which, which will, will kind of the purpose of this episode, right? Compare and contrast and all that. So, obviously, the similarities would be between the Venuan concept of ethical enclaves, which is gray and black market activity. Um, and of course, uh, the second realm, I think there, I think the, the, the difference is more one of emphasis. So essentially the Venuan ethical enclaves are basically identical to the agorist idea of the counter economy, right? Those are two different descriptors of two different libertarian strategies, agorism and vanuism of basically black and gray market activity, right? The one calls it counter economics. The other one calls it ethical enclaves. They're actually exactly the same thing as I've explained in terms of how the Agorist uh, theory of the five markets defines black and gray markets compared with white, red, and uh, pink markets. Now, that being said, I do think there's a difference of emphasis. So obviously, Vanu, you could say, is much more defensive. Uh, if you were to compare Vanu and Agorism, like I've, I think I've explained it before, that Agor, you know, it's, it's kind of like mommy and daddy. It's a duality, right? Vanu's more concerned with home and hearth, and, you know, lifestyle changes and making yourself invulnerable to coercion and so forth. Agorism is much more aggressive, uh, more aggressive and, and using trying to use market forces to abolish the state, essentially. That's kind of where the agorists are coming from, which is why those guys are my heroes. Um, the second realm is rather interesting because in some sense, it's kind of combining a lot of different features. And the reason I say it is this. The... If you were to arguably put together a formula of sorts, what I would kind of suggest is that, you know, whether it's the counter economy, the ethical enclaves, as well as some other features that are unique to the second realm, the second realm is more of like the overarching concept because the ethical enclaves and, count and the counter economy it's it's and, black and gray market, black and gray, black and gray, black and gray. The second realm expands upon that and also gets very specific. Um, you know, the mentioning of what was it, the escrow binding contracts, I think it was, and a couple other things. You know, that's that's pretty unique to the second realm. The anonymized remote control defense systems, after you've perfected the anonymized remote controlled access control points. Um, yeah, those defense systems, basically it's a, it's anonymized weaponry actually is what it is. Um, uh, oh, there it is. The bond. Right. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me step in here for a moment. So yeah, the, the difference between the second realm and Vanu, I mean, there was definitely, there's definitely aspects of, um, defense and deterrence, uh, you know, when Vanu that Rayo talked about, but the second realm is more expansive where, um, there's private arbitration, there's, uh, you know, private security, um, there's, uh, I, I guess, uh, so, so yeah, there, there definitely are, it's I like, guess. Uh, it's like a more, yeah. it's like a more well-developed version of an ethical enclave and it's much more specific, whereas ethical enclaves in the counter economy are kind of broad descriptors of black and gray market activity. The second realm kind of takes that, that those kernels and really runs with it. So for example, the use of contract registries and evidence retention systems, mediation and arbitration services, escrow and bonding services. I mean, that's all second realm stuff. The notion of a proxy merchant is specifically a second realm idea and, and so forth. So that's that, and see, and oh, that's the other thing too about the second realm, which perhaps uh, the Agorists and to some degree, maybe even the Vanuans didn't fully elaborate on, nor necessarily should they. It's just this is kind of what happened, at least according to the literature, is kind of the notion of the anonymized remote controlled access points as basically being essentially the equivalent of like a private property border. So the second realm very much has borders, even though the physical space may be maybe more like a temporary autonomous zone, a TAS. There still are borders, 
And where the second realmers are in a particular locale, even if it's just for an evening to have like, you know, a party, so to speak, as remember, that was how the Taz is first got conceived of by Hakeem Bay was that, well, we need mm -hmm. we have the right to party. But it wasn't just some, you know, nightclub -y thing. There was there was a more principled element to it that, that Hakeem Bay was trying to get at. And the second realm develops uh, that, too. I guess you could say this. Ethical enclaves plus counter uh, plus the counter economy plus temporary autonomous zones equal the second realm could be one mm. formula because the second realm is the overarching concept. Kind of like with the servile society is kind of the overarching concept that ties together collective movementism with controlled schizophrenia with political crusading, which we've explained before on uh, previous episodes of the Vanu podcast. I would argue here that the second realm, kind of like the servile society, is in the sense of being the polar opposite. Um, the second realm is the overarching concept that ties together, I would say very neatly. The agorist counter economy, the Venuan ethical enclaves, and uh, temporary autonomous zones, by uh, which was Hakeem Bay's concept. I, I think it's tying together these different elements, and then of course adding some original material in there as well. So we have like a really well-rounded, yet another libertarian strategy that actually has half a chance in hell of working. Um, because, uh, you know, most of the throughout most of libertarian history, uh, if you go back to Murray Rothbard, it's pretty much all political crusading of one flavor or another. And of course, Dr. Rothbard was familiar and at one point uh, supportive and then changed his mind once he actually, you know, found out that, oh, this doesn't work kind of thing. Um, that the various 20 million different flavors of political crusading are not the way to go. So when it went more towards the uh, in the direction of well direct action, you had agorism, and then of course there's Vanu, and then I would add that probably a third one would probably be the well. Va one. Vanu came before agorism, but fair and yes, and that's true. So Vanu, agorism, and then probably the second realm is probably the order in which it happened. And there are differences of emphasis, yes, but aside from the difference of emphasis, I think they're very these three different libertarian strategies are very much and. Following kind of a, a, a similar, hmm, a similar epoch of of sort, a similar footprint of such, where it's all direct action based. Um, obviously, Agorism is not really big on the lifestyle changes like Vanu is, but it's still a good thing because both of them are against political crusading, and they're all about you know uh, either doing things by yourself and or doing things in concert with people that you know, like a peer-to-peer -peer relationships, people you actually know, people you'd be willing to vouch for, which actually is more important than not, and and so forth. And that, I mean, that's just kind of that's just kind of where it's at. So, yeah, well, I want to make I want to make one note here. Um, we've been talking about import, export, and proxy merchants, and uh, I, I think Rayo Rayo t talked about this. He didn't. I don't think he actually put it into action, but um, he definitely did for import exports. Um, so you'd be exporting labor. Um, back to the Servile Society and importing goods and knowledge back to your uh, back to your Vanu home base. Um, that's very much uh, uh, very much a part of the second realm. Uh, you know, going from the first realm to the second realm, there is that import export there. Um, and he even went further to say that, you know, not having to go out there himself and hire a guy with a truck that can you know bring uh, three months worth of food or something like that, and you know a group of uh, Vanuans can pay him uh, to you know bring down the cost, kind of the logistical aspect of it. Um, so Rayo did kind of conceive of that a little bit, but uh, he didn't really flesh it out. He definitely didn't flesh it out as much uh, as the, the Second Realm's concept of proxy merchants. So I wanted to leave that there. Sure. And something else I kind of want to mention here, too, which is also comes to the book on strategy, was the mentioning about networks of mutual aid. Now, I'm very actually – I'm quite happy they actually mention this at any real length in the book because the concept of mutual aid I think is more relevant than not here. Mutual aid is an even stems or at least can be traced back to even some other anarchic schools of thought that are that are actually even veer into the the, the kind of anti propertarian uh, flavors too because it doesn't necessarily have to involve money but again whether it involves money or not money uh, property or not property the idea of mutual aid I, I think is 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 good is better than not and the reason I'm mentioning it here is because when you're engaging in counter economic slash ethical enclave slash gray and or black market activity, 
um, not everything has to be traded using anything as a form of money. There's always direct barter. There's always trading favors, which, oh, by the way, that's what organized crime does. They, they always trade favors. And that's not just in like fiction that they those writers over over decades actually borrowed that fr that concept from actual organized criminals and so forth. Like, oh, uh, uh, oh Johnny, you owe me a favor. You know, I need you to whack this guy or whatever. And that that actually happens in real life, by the way. The whole concept of trading favors. So uh, not necessarily where money of any kind is exchanging hands, but it's kind of work for work's sake. And sometimes it balances out, sometimes not, obviously, because uh, because of the indivisibility issue. But that's getting into economics. Uh, you know, a little bit of the double coincidence of wants as well, which is why money came about. Um, but without getting into an economics lesson about that, um, I think mutual aid is is definitely a good way to go, especially if money is either – not an option for whatever reason, or even if it is an option, it's just preferable not to use it in certain circumstances. So it was very cool of the guys who wrote the book on strategy for the second realm to kind of mention that, hey, mutual aid is also kind of part of this whole thing too. Um, sure, sure. And I mean, it, it could also be kind of viewed, at, at least in one, one way they explained it, is it, it could also be as kind of an insurance policy. Sure. Um, since, since you know, it's black and gray markets and the state is, is awful and violent and, you know, they, they might apprehend some of our guys in the second realm. Uh, well, if, uh, you know, that's the if John, who just got, uh, you know, apprehended, has a family and, uh, you know, he's not making him money now, uh, maybe, you know, whether it was mutual aid c completely or whether it was kind of... Uh, all right, we've got 50 people here. Let's all toss in, you know, $20 a month. And uh, then, at, you know, if, any, if anything bad happens, um, your families will be taken care of or something like that. So I think it can be viewed kind of synonymously as mutual aid as well as kind of uh, uh, as, as insurance because it would be it would be mutual aid. Right, of course. And something and, and also something else, too, regarding security culture, I was thrilled when the promotion and advocacy for pseudonyms was something that was really pounded on in the book. And I will I will say this about the Agoras and to some degree even the Venuans. I really had wished that the uh, that those two had been more there had been a, a greater emphasis on pseudonyms. I think the Venuans were a little bit farther along in that it was like privacy is important, and the Agoras Rayo Rayo definitely was right, um, right. along that point. Right, yeah. and and the Agoras kind of kind of flit back and forth, I suppose. Even though I personally think they should because of the riskiness of the kind of uh, uh, stuff that they tend to do more often than not. Um, but what I really like about the book on strategy regarding on the second realm is that they explicitly said pseudonyms are a good thing. People who uh, of the mainstream culture, uh, the servile society, if you will, who basically say that people who use pseudonyms are criminals, even if they're not doing anything um, immoral or even illegal, uh, they're, they're still scummy in some sense. And I love how they just kind of flip that around and said, no, pseudonyms are a good thing for like these 20 million different reasons or whatever. And I said, thank, thank goodness. It's about yeah, yeah, damn and, yeah. There were there, there were I guess a, a couple a couple um, I guess reasons they 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 liked them. And one was um, why would you want to go by your legal name in the first realm? If you're in the second realm, you know it's two different lives, um, so you have a different name. So it's kind of like it's a way to segregate the first and the second realm. And also too, yeah, as as part of security culture, um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely uh, definitely wise. Well, yeah, and and you know, as I've mentioned before in previous episodes or whatever, um, on various different you know podcasts I've I've been on, whether I've been interviewed or doing the interviewing or just co-hosting or whatever, like I mean, this is a pseudonym I use. So the fact that these guys are pretty much in my corner right from the get-go about something that's kind of very near and dear to me is like, thank goodness, because most people in the alternative media despise others who don't use their alleged real name. Oh, the legal name bestowed on you by the state that's on your birth certificate and driver's license. How dare you not use that? You're a bad person if you don't use that. And it's all this stupid finger-waving crap. And I'm glad the Second Realmers were saying no to that. That a free people, free individuals who use pseudonyms are not criminals by default because they use pseudonyms. Because I've been dealing with that crap for years. And it's finally good to see a good vindication of it coming not from me, but from but from other folks. And it was it was it was very I thought I view that as very positive and and a long time coming, let me put it that way. Right, right. And as I said, Rayo did uh, he originally did write. 
uh, you know, their articles published with uh, his first name was Tom. Uh, Mr. Tom Marshall, and uh, I don't know what uh, what year it happened uh, or, or anything like that, but uh, eventually he did switch to to El Rey and then Rayo. Uh, so yeah, he was very much in favor of pseudonyms, and also uh, Roberta or uh, Doctor Gatherer or uh, Halen Hygia. I mean, they were both heavily into pseudonyms, and uh, it kind of made it confusing at times. Uh, as I remember, it was one of the episodes of the Bonnie podcast. We didn't know if he had a few different women or if he, you know, had one or, or whatever it was. But yeah, they were both heavily into pseudonyms. So, um, so Ray was there with you. So yeah, uh, so yeah well, that. well, as opposed to Sam Konkin is Sam Konkin and Murray Rothbard is Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises is Ludwig von Mises and so on and so forth. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I just prefer not to. You know, I don't want to be the next uh, Lou Rockwell or or whomever else. Believe me, I don't. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, most of the alternative media, from my experience, is pretty hostile to people who use pseudonyms. And that's not going to change in the foreseeable future, uh, in large part because of my experience, uh, such as it has been. So um, I guess this I would like to think that the second realm – uh, is more open to the use of pseudonyms than the alternative media has unfortunately been in large part. Well, again, certain exceptions here and there, but I'm saying for the large part, it's been pretty hostile and it's been pretty. Right. Now, I remember, I remember in hashtag Agora actually uh, when he walked into that uh, private club for the first time, and he's like, "Yeah, my name's John Smith." I don't remember what his name was. Mm -hmm. My name's John Smith, and they're like, "Is that your legal name?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they kind of scolded him a little bit. Good. And eventually, eventually he got. Uh, got through that and uh, did adopt a pseudonym, especially after he was, uh, uh, you know, after he got uh, close to that woman. So Right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah right. for sure. Yeah, the Second Realm definitely heavy in, heavily in favor of uh, pseudonyms. And as a yeah. side note, it's very much a mind control. This is hardly ever mentioned in the alternative media. Might as well mention it here. It is very much a mind control technique for an individual to, for whatever reason, even if it's just an acquiescence, which is what it is a lot of the time with a lot of different things, it is a mind control technique for an individual to allow their identity, their personal sense of identity, to be dictated and otherwise labeled by government bureaucracy, whether in the form of a birth certificate, driver's license, passports, God help you if you got a voter registration card, or what other other form of official government. Yeah, cancel that shit. Right. Well, at least with the voter registration, right? At the bare minimum. Yeah, tinyurl.com forward slash cancel But, but what I'm right. saying is that even with other forms of the officially, you know, licensed, uh, whatever the hell, uh, you know, government uh, licensure and such, uh, people start, at least over time, start identifying themselves and identifying mentally with the name that's on the, the pieces of paper, and I think if I had to guess that cultural value, because remember the second realm is very big on culture, that cultural value of the first realm places on names. You must have, you know, the name that's on there is the name you will always be known by, you know, unless, unle unless, unless you go to the courts and request a formal legal name change, such as when you're getting married, uh, which of course has its own licensure and such, right? Um, that that's so except for that exception, you're not allowed to. And I've been pretty much saying nuts to that. I'm going to call myself whatever the hell I want because that's what the original Americans did. The original colonists, they would change names whenever they moved to a new area, you know, start a new life. You know, sometimes I was part of westward expansion, but sometimes not. But the idea is starting over or otherwise trying to get something resembling a clean slate for whatever reason. And the fact that the first realm doesn't value that is a major problem, meaning you can't, they don't ever want you to escape your past. With the second realm, by contrast, if you want to, shall we say, start over in some sense, which by the way is a very older American idea, um, then, then you can actually have half a chance in hell of doing that. And that is what I really value, is kind of getting like a brand new reputation and it's up to you know it's kind of like yeah, up to each individual whether they're gonna you know per you know have a good one or trash it or whatever that's on them you know personal responsibility and all that but at least you have an opportunity to at least try in the first realm they don't want you to have an opportunity to try you know if you're a felon you're a felon for life it doesn't matter if you hurt somebody else or not in the second realm you have a chance to start over right right so I think there's one other point here, and, and, and maybe, I, I guess maybe you've, you've kind of talked me out of this a little bit uh, as far as a conclusion, but 
But I guess even even Rayo's polyethylene A-tents uh, with Roberta would be a second realm, regardless of whether it was just him, him and Roberta, or him and five other Volney families. Um, so I, I think, at least in some sense, it would be a second realm. But I think the distinctions you pointed out earlier uh, were, uh, you know, were, I think, valuable. So so what do you think? Would, would uh, him his polyethylene A-tent with him and his community of two uh, be considered a second realm? Arguably, probably not, simply because they didn't have uh, strict access control points. Um, now, if they did, maybe. I mean, that one's kind of a judgment call. The idea of a second realm is that there's enough people in it, even if it's not very many, to basically facilitate some form of market interaction where people are trading and all that. And therefore, the practice of tradecraft the practice of like those escrow bonding services and all that stuff would actually be feasible. If you have just two people or even three or even four or five people, that's not necessarily enough numbers of, let's say, merchants um, or, or traders. Let's call them traders um, to really require those kind of services. So I think what you're kind of getting at, I think what you're implying and not to sound too much like an economist, you're basically kind of you're kind of asking me a question more related to, to economies of scale. I think is what you're kind of getting at when the economy of scale is basically subsistence level, which I think is what you're really getting at. Um, there's really not a need for a second realm in some sense. Um, or at most the second realm would be pretty much strictly a cultural thing and not much else. As opposed to if the economies of scale were noticeably larger to varying degrees, then the second realm becomes much more of a tangible thing, a tangible reality where you really do need access control points. And then depending on how things go, you really do need the anonymized remote control defense systems, the defense weaponry and and so forth. Not to mention uh, other types of services. The uh, you know, those um, I think it was also mentioned in the book on strategy. What was it? The, the what was it? The double blind trading booths or whatever. Again, if you have mm -hmm. two people, they already know each other. I mean, they're just good friends. That we're that, that's that everything's on a personal level at that point. Um, let me put it this way: I think the second realm is more geared towards folks who aren't necessarily going to be you know best friends with each other or or close friends or family. I think the second realm is a way for like strangers to interact who have who have shared cultural values, but there's like no real family history in a sense. If you want to think of it that way, no personal histories, and things are more anonymized in some sense. Um, uh, again, whether it be digital or real world, um, I think that's probably one major distinction, as opposed to something like a Vanu Association, where I would assume pretty much everybody knows everybody else. Uh, they may not tell each other where each other's Vanu shelters are, right? Because I think there was an admonition about that, like, don't do that, right? Um, for other reasons, because uh, we want to maintain invulnerability to coercion and all that. But uh, again, you can't rat out somebody if you don't know where, where certain things are, right? <laughs> right. So so that, that leads me to, I guess, a question that I just sure. thought of. Uh, obviously, Second Realms being uh, uh, predominantly, I would say, you know, as, as they discussed in Second Realm book on strategy and kind of the reference to uh, Hakeem Bey's uh, article on the subject or – post or short book or whatever it is um they're definitely more you know tacit so they're more mm -hmm. mobile yeah. so um and that's that's not inconsistent with uh with you know the strategy rare pursuit or, or the smoomins the super <laughs> um but the the, the 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 question is would there be vanu home bases in second realms would it be uh, I, well, I guess aurora is a bad example of this because people knew each other um you know very very well um, so, so I guess, would there be Vanu home bases in second? Arguably world? so. I think it's more a difference of emphasis, right? So as long as the Vanu shelters part was still consistent where you're not really inviting like the complete strangers to your home, then you could go to say, you know, remember, I think, I think Rayo mentioned this at, at some length too, about people would still have their Vanu shelters, but then they would travel and congregate together in certain areas so that they could trade and all that, and then they would split off again. So there would be kind of a, it's almost kind of like an organism where they were, you know, contracting and expanding, right? They contract to the um, to the tra to the more dense, you know, market trading areas, and then they would expand back out to uh, to back their home. So contract, expand, contract, expand. If you want to think of it that way, kind of like a like a big organism of sorts, uh, our our market organism, so to speak. Um, Right. So, yeah. So I remember in hashtag Agor for this, too, when uh, th when uh, the, the guy actually went to the, the woman's house for the I think the mm -hmm. first time and it was like a hidden bedchamber. Yes. essentially. So she had her own she had her own place. Uh, um, some of the other folks did, too, and, and all of mm -hmm. that. So um, so the volume home bases, it seems 
Um, the second realms are mobile, but then they have uh, their Vanu home mm-hmm. bases. So they're secured Vanu home bases where they can be uh, invulnerable to coercion or as invulnerable mm-hmm. as they can be. Um, those seem to be in separate kind of locations. Yes. So I think I think yeah, in some in some sense, yeah, I guess there could be Vanu home bases in second realms, but um, but I I, th- I think those would probably kind of remain uh, in the first realm for for a, a large part of it, unless there's uh, you know. Uh, well, yeah, I think that's well. Kind of going to actually a different uh, of piece of fiction um, alongside night. Do you remember? Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Aur- I think it was called Aurora. I think it was the yep, yep, yep. now. If you remember the structure of Aurora, I think that would more than qualify as a second realm in large part because the, even the construction of Aurora Definitely. had to be different. It's now to be fair, it is closer more to like a permanent autonomous zone, a PAS. Uh, that is one difference, and it's also kind of, in some sense, closer to being more of a private city. But but, it, but mm, no, it's it really is more of a second realm. It's not any, and it was also literally underground, not just metaphorically underground. It was literally underground too in that novel. Uh, but remember, part of that superstructure, the actual physical thing itself, uh, part of that superstructure. I think there were people that were actually living there. Like they had hotel rooms, like people would live in like for longer periods, not just for a night or two nights or a vacation, but people actually like lived, lived there. Um, they also had like like a gym area or whatever. I, I think there was like a bypassing like orgy scene or something. But the point was that there were people there who would treat it kind of like a vacation type thing. And there were other people where it was more like a home for them. Um, it just depended on what people wanted to do. Yeah, so, 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 so you had people transitioning between the first and the second realm, and then you had people who were fully into the second yes. realm, as they talked about in, in second books. Uh, uh, second and realm just, books just like and yeah. just like you know, the, the description of the second realm, remember there was also that scene later when, when our main characters were leaving Aurora because it was actually an evacuation because they were getting raided, actually, was what was happening. More similar to the second realm, uh, all the Agoras were basically evacuating everybody. Uh, out of Aurora when when they were being raided. So that right and see that's the other thing too. In the second round book on strategy, it is explicitly mentioned that there is so much inspiration they got from Agorism, Sam Conkin, etc. And I can see why, especially if you're looking at something like Alongside Night, the novel, uh, where Aurora got evacuated. The idea of like evacuating you know, a particular physical locale of the second realm kind of makes sense. So if there is like an advanced, excuse me, if there's like an advanced detection technology of some sort that, oh, or or even just we got word from our source inside the local police department, we're getting raided, to, you know, tonight, later at, let's say, hypothetically, you know, uh, X, you know, sometime in the evening at, at this particular time or roughly right around this time, we should probably evacuate everybody, you know, at least three hours ahead of time, right? Just to keep the customer safe and so forth. Um you know, that I, I think in some ways they kind of got that inspiration from Alongside Night. So that's not completely crazy. Um, and, and something I'm more I'm I'm totally in favor of because that actually is a peaceful solution so that you don't get into like a raging gunfight and or um, you, you just kind of avoid problems. You just evacuate the area and you, just, and you set. Yeah, you're 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 probably not going to win. And if you uh, if you win that one battle. Uh, I mean, you're just going to relocate anyways. Why risk losing people? Why risk, uh, um, I guess, uh, your asses, so to speak, when you can just move? Well, that's what – and see, that's what or, and see, that's what the organized criminals usually do. You see, the I would say this. The fictional depiction of organized criminals really is fiction. The reality of organized crime is quite different um, because they, too, have to look at their balance sheets. They, too, have to – you know, see whether certain risks of cooperating, of quote unquote cooperating, really being manipulated by um, the undercover, uh, you know, uh, blue coats and so forth is worth it or not. Because sometimes it's worth it to, for them to snitch and sometimes not. But remember, they're amoral, so they're, they'll they'll be willing to do whatever the hell. Because um, that's 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 organized crime for you. They they already do immoral things. So if they happen to do amoral things, that's kind of almost a, a night. That's almost their their version of being nice people. So when it comes to sure, so when sure. it comes to more ethical activities and trying to facilitate some sort of truly um, I don't want to use this certain language but I can't think of a better way to put it right offhand a true civilization of some kind with actual real cultural norms that that people adhere to society well I guess that's another way of putting it I suppose sure um, the point is that once you have those norms. Not laws, but norms that people follow because they understand it facilitates peace and trade and such. 
then 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 that then then we're we're well on our way towards towards uh, a functional uh, second realm of one kind or another. And and that and that's that's just where it is. Um, I do think there's one thing worth mentioning: um, the notion of import export and and the role of the proxy merchants. The agorists really don't emphasize this really. It's not a contradiction for them to do that kind of thing, but it's not a point of emphasis for them, right? They want to abolish state degree and black market trading. The second realmers are more similar to the Venuans, at least when it comes to import, export, and proxy merchants, because they too realize that some sort of interfacing with the mainstream culture, at least for the time being, as they're building the second realm, is 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 just you know uh, the nature of the beast, so to speak. And I really like that because that really kind of dovetails into what Rayo was saying back in the 60s and 70s, that there needs to be some sort of interfacing. And as the economies of scale, shall we say, upgrades or otherwise develops, then perhaps less Venuans and even second realmers would have to necessarily do import export. And given the reality of division of labor, only some of them would specialize in being the proxy merchants, in facilitating actual import export. And the rest of the Venuans and company would just be existing more or less wholesale in an ethical enclave in a second realm, etc. And obviously, I, I would I would kind of suggest that that would kind of extend out to the agorist notion of the counter economy too. That they could be in even the agorist would benefit from uh, this in some sense, where they could actually be in the counter economy more so than not because of the Venuans and the second realmers and so forth. So I really see these three different libertarian strategies and the adherence of these strategies as being more cooperative rather than not because they're emphasizing different things that I honestly think is more similar to a divi uh, is more similar to labor specialization because they're emphasizing different things they can mutually reinforce each other and that's personally how I view it the agoras have their strengths which are different from the venuans which in turn are somewhat different from the second realmers they're just it's a difference of emphasis that's all it is they're more or less along the same line uh, same track uh, line you know, line of thought as it were the same track yeah different uh, different pieces to the same in, puzzle in some sense right and and remember all three of them are virulently anti-political which is the starting which is at least a starting point or at least a point of commonality um, the second realmers – oh, here's another difference. The second realmers are very uh, heavy, as we mentioned in previous episodes, very heavy on uh, culture, the importance of culture and all that. The agorists arguably are not. They're more concerned about – making the trades happen pretty much virtually by any means necessary, and then whatever happens after that is whatever happens. Um, and of course, the Venuans are more focused on you know the invulnerability coercion, making sure hearth and home is taken care of and so forth. Again, it's a difference of a difference of emphasis, which I think is good because what you're really having here is essentially a market selection of libertarian resistance to the state, a lot of libertarian resistance to statism. And I think that's healthy personally. So for some people who may not, not necessarily like agorism, they may, may want to look at Vanu. And for people who may not like Vanu, they may want to go more in the direction of a second realm. And for somebody who doesn't like the second realm, well, maybe, I don't know, agorism would be good for them. And we can kind of go in, go around in this triangle of sorts. Because I think that's probably one conceptual way of thinking about it, is that they all mutually reinforce each other in different ways. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. There are far more uh, commonalities than there are differences. Uh, and, you know, as we've been saying this entire time, uh, the second realm was kind of the uh, uh, the more overarching uh, aspect of it. Um, agorism, obviously, is focused on, you know, trading. Vanu could be, um, but generally speaking, probably isn't all that much. Um, and, you know, combining all of these things, especially Vanu's focus on security culture uh, and, and things like that, uh, they really do complement each other yes, nicely. Yes, so. yeah, and, that, and I would say that's a point of commonality between the second realm and Vanu that agorism, I personally think, should have, but technically it doesn't, is security culture, security culture, security culture. I mean, the second realmers are like doggedly annoying about it, and I love them for it um, because they understand that what they're doing 
in some sense is risky, but even if it wasn't risky, they should do it anyway, just out of principle. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that heavy focus. And I love this. I love this part in the book and I don't have the quote up, but I don't have the, the portion out of it. But but it's, it's just privacy is a part of our autonomy. And therefore, we are very secure about our right. privacy. It's just that's kind a, of, you know, we have our autonomy. One aspect of that is privacy, and that's why we are. Right, the and they're doing are. that based on principle. Um, one other thing I want to mention before we, we keep on going here is, you know, Sam Conkin kind of envisioned the different phases of an Agora society, or excuse me, of an emerging Agora society of sorts. So, like, for example, he mentioned, now technically, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, Technically, right now, we're in a low-density, what he called a low-density Agora society, meaning that Agoras exist at all. There may not be very many, but they're here. Um, the next one was mid-density, small condensation Agora society, and then the next one after that is a high-density, large condensation Agora society. Then, of course, after that, the winning phase, if you will, is the Agora society with statist impurities. I would suggest... I'm not thoroughly convinced. I would say it's an, it's arguable that it would be either the mid-density small condensation Agora society or the high-density large condensation Agora society would be another way of describing a more developed second realm in some sense. So I do think there's kind of an overlap of that where as, as, as the Agorists have certain areas that they essentially – Mm, they essentially liberate from the state because because they're closer to being revolutionaries, although not quite, um, that as they, shall we say, liberate certain areas, um, that by default, those liberated areas are kind of like a second realm almost by default or at least a potential second realm. And I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. So – you know, as as we as as individuals gain more and more liberty just by you know exercising it mainly, and also working in tandem with each other as 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 they can and are willing to and so forth, I th I view this kind of as a win win win. There's basically you know the agorists win by getting closer to abolishing the state through gray and black market trading. By developing their agorist networks of trade, the Venuans win by gaining a greater invulnerability to coercion that they had before, and the Second Realmers win by basically building, well, a much more effective Second Realm than they had before. So that's why I said win, 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 three ways. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So I guess let's begin to, uh, I guess, I think we've kind of already started uh, to, be, to, to close out, but uh, I guess uh, what are your closing thoughts for the listeners? I would say, in some sense, the differences between the Second Realm, Agorism, and Vanu, as well as the similarities between them, it's not necessarily nitpicking or, or, or splitting hairs, as some people may or may not uh, later argue. I view it more, again, to say this for the millionth time, I view it as a difference of emphasis. They are emphasizing different things, which of course I think is good because that means we have a broader market selection of libertarian resistance strategies to the state. I think that is very healthy. So for example, if somebody doesn't like agorism, then there's always Vanu. If somebody doesn't like those two, there's the second realm. And if you have some strange person who doesn't like the second realm, well, you, they, they can either choose between agorism and Vanu or maybe – or maybe they could do a Gorsman Vanu, but then shun the second realm for whatever strange reason, right? You know, the customers. Or maybe maybe they go back to libertyunderattack.com forward slash food of the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action and start choosing other things from there if for some reason these don't suit them. So, right. I mean, there's – there's uh, I mean, with, with these, I mean, there's over 100 strategies, uh, you know, compared to the uh, maybe dozen at most for the political mm -hmm. crusading strategies. Yep. So – uh, so yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of ways to uh, to resist the state and to increase your personal freedom, or, uh, well, I guess, and or your uh, invulnerability. To yeah, yes, agreed. And so, to kind of uh, piggyback off of what you were kind of mentioning, if for some strange reason somebody doesn't like the ideas or the strategies of the second realm and agorism and Vanu, then there's always like direct action, you know, the more garden variety direct action of, of various flavors like what's mentioned in the Freedom Umbrella of direct action. I mean, there are so many choices, it's not even funny. Um, all I'm saying is that comparing the second realm with Agorism and Vanu is just, it's a difference of emphasis, and I personally view it more like a triangle where they're mutually reinforcing each other. Um, and, and of course, I would say one of their similarities is, of course, being anti-political. Um, I guess one other thing, too, is kind of worth mentioning. 
there, you know, I, I know, I know there are people who like self-identify as like voluntarists and kind of like where do they fall in uh, and among all this. They're they're kind in in a lot of ways they're kind of like the heart and soul of libertarianism as far as I view it, uh, where it's about strategically withdrawing from the state, withdrawing your consent to be governed if there is such a concept as consent to be governed in the first place, but if there is withdrawing it, not consenting and so forth. Um, but remember, as far as as far as like the the stricter voluntarist literature goes, it's 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 in some ways more of a negation of. Of uh, like political crusading, which is good, but then there's not really any. I mean, then after that, it's just kind of well, what, 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 well, anything that's voluntary is good, and you know, kind of go with that. And it is suggestive of direct action, but it's not. It's not giving that extra oomph. Not that it should, because going up against political crusading is already kind of that's that's kind of quote unquote radical for 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 many uh you know good americans shall we say who are in many ways like the good germans during world war ii so for too many of the good americans did i just insult everybody or most everybody yes i just did um yeah so for the good americans like the good germans for most good americans being a voluntarist is like way too out there for them because you're basically saying nuts to political crusading and everything and the collective movementism and everything that that kind of entails I would say, though, that with voluntarism, it's just – it's more of like a purely philosophical thing, which is good, but there's not really – aside from something like canceling voter registration, which is more of a legal interstice in some sense, aside from that, there's not really too much else as far as I understand that particular uh, philosophical uh, position. The nice thing about Agorism, Vanu, the Second Realm, and of course direct action more generally is that it basically takes that heart and soul kind of idea of voluntarism and it makes it practical. And that I think is what the primary market value is of these different things. It takes that small kernel that the voluntarists gave us the insight, like Wendy McElroy and others, that key voluntarist insight, and then it makes it practical. It takes it from that philosophical, firm, you know, deontological rooting, and then it makes it real in real life uh, for people who want to see something physical, who may not necessarily be good with abstract thought, because not everybody wants to be a philosopher and so forth. Uh, again, market demand, people demand different things, right? Um, that's that's where I think the value is. It's essentially fulfilling the the vision of voluntarism, of vo of interactions between humans being strictly voluntary. And only voluntary, where coercion is virtually non-existent, and where it does exist, it is an aberration, it is an evil, and it is something to uh, pretty much be punished, or at the very least shunned and ostracized. Um, obviously, you know, if if there is such a thing as a uh, <laughs> parallel economy, as Rayo kind of pulled it, uh, termed it, you know, coercers should never be tolerated. And so, Vanu, Agorism, the second realm direct action more generally, all of this is geared towards fulfilling the philosophical vision of voluntarism itself. Yes, I agree and well said. Well said. So uh, that's all we have for you. Next week, we will discuss Akeem Bey's idea of temporary autonomous zones and what role those play in the development and maintaining of, of second realms, which, uh, you know, as with the uh, first, uh, I guess, uh, the three episodes that Kyle's joined me on, uh, it should be uh, very clear. Uh, that temporary autonomous zones are absolutely crucial to, uh, again, the development and, mate, um, and maintaining of Second Realm. So if you enjoy the content, please consider sharing it around and making a financial contribution. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash support dash us. Please share the podcast around uh, and uh, all that good stuff. Help us help us grow the podcast. Put this information into the ears of more folks. Uh, you know, Second Realms can only be created with uh, devoted freedom pioneers. So uh, that's all we've got. Thanks, you guys. If you take a look at the world around you, the outlook for personal freedom can appear quite grim. The size and scope of government continues to increase, regardless of the endless promises by political rulers to rein it in. The government robs you of more and more of your income every single day, and there appears to be no end to their thievery in sight. The revelations by Edward Snowden and other leaks paint a picture of an omnipotent, all-seeing government. Privacy is definitely a thing of the past. With all of these obstacles and others to overcome, freedom may really seem dead. But it's not.
Back in the 1960s, a freedom pioneer by the name of Rayo developed a strategy known as VANU, which is premised around the invulnerability to coercion, whether public, government, or private criminals. It was largely forgotten until early 2017 when Shane and Kyle launched the VANU podcast, a podcast discussing all things VANU. If you're an individual looking for practical solutions in regaining your personal freedom, then the VANU podcast is the podcast for you. Subjects discussed include the philosophy behind VANU, survivalism, financial independence, crypto anarchism, country shopping, and much, much more. Find the website at vanupodcast.com. That is Victor, Oscar, November, Uniform, Podcast.com. And make sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher. Again, that is vanupodcast.com. The outlook for personal freedom has never looked better.